Okay, this this is a good one. As Isla Kreischer would say, this is a good one. But it is a good one. So I don't know what else to say except this is a good one because it's a good one. So Paulina Pinsky is back on the podcast on Wife of the Party. And we are talking about, among other things, eating disorders. She is in recovery for an eating disorder that she kind of suffered with uh, from about seventh grade, I think, until she was in college. Uh, so brave of her to come and share her story and to share what she's learned through um, going through having an eating disorder. It was such a great conversation. I learned a ton. We define some eating disorders in this uh, episode, and we talk about what she did for treatment, how she reached out for help. Uh, we also talk about what it's like to have Drew as a dad and how that has affected her uh, in life. Bert comes in for a little bit, and we talk about how he feels about food, and um, it was just very helpful. She's also running a an artist way uh, workshop, and I will put a link to her website on my website, wifeotp.com. And we are offering one scholarship for her artist way workshop. So you can email her. Her website, I believe, is paulinapinsky.com. You can go there and reach out to her and apply for a scholarship if you're interested in doing an artist way workshop. Um, she also uh, does some writing coaching. If you're looking to write a college essay or write a personal essay, she does some coaching for that as well. So definitely a lovely, uh, thoughtful, dynamic uh, young lady. And I'm very happy to have had her as a guest again. So thank you, Paulina. Thank you. Uh, for sharing your story. I hope that you enjoy this episode. If you know someone who could use this information, please share it. Um, please share it with anybody you think would be interested. Thanks for coming back every week. Thanks for being a avid listener. I appreciate it. And I hope you enjoy this episode with Paulina Pinsky. Hello. It's so nice to see you again. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for saying it's an honor. I feel honored. <laughs> <laughs> um, I learned so much from your book. I had such a great time talking to you and your dad. Um, I have quoted this book to so many people. I've oh. given three away. Really? I have. Wow. Yeah. Uh, it was a great, great conversation. I enjoyed it so much. It was amazing to be here. It was so lovely to meet you. And I'm so honored that the book has resonated with you and that you're giving it to people. That's that's the highest praise you could give. Ah. <laughs> like you're giving it out. Like I'm I'm on again, I'm honored. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a great book. It's a great little like tool. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, you know, the writing of the book, um, we did it in six months. Mm -hmm. So it was a really quick turnaround. Yeah. Um, but I will say that the structure of the book has facilitated conversations between me and my dad that would have never happened otherwise. And that was like a really surprising outcome. Yeah. Because, you know, you walk into this book and you're like, all right, we got to write a consent book. Like, what's that about? And, you know, TCB being the framework, trust, compassion and boundaries. It's just such a helpful framework for literally all relationships. Mm -hmm. And I feel, you know, since promoting this book and talking about this book, I feel like it's kind of uh, made me step up a little bit interpersonally, you know? Really? Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. It's It's been an unexpected outcome. That's so cool because, you know, that's such a great lesson in life because yeah. sometimes not sometimes. I think every time you do something monumental, writing a book, I think inarguably is monumental. Yeah. There's so much positive collateral that comes out of that, right? Definitely. And sometimes you have no idea when you start what that collateral is going to be. Obviously, you know some of it. You yeah. know it's going to be great experience. You're going to have a be a published author. Yeah. If you weren't already, a, I was not a published author again or is whatever. Okay yeah, make, like hundred, make okay. yourself completely at home. I don't. Um, <laughs> no, no pretense here at all. So um, that's why I like it here. I know. No, no, make yourself at home. <laughs> but I, I love it when there's like an unexpected gem. That's the best because I think in some ways you appreciate it more. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so we, we started writing the book in 2019 and we did, we finished it like April, 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and so we sat on it for a while because like thing, we kept pushing back the release or whatever. 
And so by the time we were promoting it, my brother, he'll come up in this conversation because he actually he helped me prepare for this. Oh, awesome. He's getting a master's in psychology. And so um, he's become very um, therapeutic in his mode of connection. And so Mm -hmm. he like called me and he was like, listen, Mm -hmm. like this is a big opportunity and you need to prepare. Oh, and it's like the week before and he's like, what is consent? And I was like, you know, kind of stumbling through my words. And he was like, you need to know what you say in the book. Right. Because if you're going to promote this book, you got to look like, you know, your stuff. And I was like, oh, you're right. Like, I got to pull it together. And so it was very um, centering and focusing for me Mm -hmm. and sort of the unexpected um, gems of this experience is that I've I've I have more freelance writing clients and, you know, like I'm just I'm doing everything and I'm going with it. And it's just kind of because I never expected to go down the dad route. You yeah. know, it's like that exists, but I never was like, I'm going to jump on my dad's train and launch a career off of that. Right. Um, and now that I'm here, I'm like, OK, how do I do this deliberately? Mm-hmm. How I, I had a therapist, um, a, a non-binary therapist, and they were talking about um, for uh, Lawrence Fishburne. Mm-hmm. Do you know who he is? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, of course. And <laughs> essentially the analogy that we came up with was that. I was in my Cowboy Curtis phase. Uh-huh. I was in Pee Wee's Playhouse. Like, I'm in Dr. Drew's Playhouse. And I'm going to launch and do The Matrix soon. But we just don't... We have to do the, the you know, the Cowboy Curtis in the, pl- in the Playhouse first. Totally. You know? And so I'm trying to, like, be my best Cowboy Curtis. Uh-huh. <laughs> so that, you know, when I do the memoir or whatever it is I'm going to do, you know... I can have my matrix. Right. Yeah. That's so uh, bright. That's very bright and very wise because I think myself included, when I was young, I thought my first thing was going to be major and then I could write my own checks. Yep. And it's so not true. And sometimes, like I started out wanting to uh, be a, a high school guidance counselor. Wow. And then I changed into wanting to develop commercial real estate. And then I changed into wanting to be an actress. And then I changed into writing. And then writing led me to Bert. And then now I have this life that is more amazing than I could have imagined. Could have never thought up this life. Where I get to podcast, I get to do whatever I want creatively. I get to have input with my husband's creative career. I have my own creativity. And when I started college to be a high school guidance counselor, none of this podcasting wasn't even big. I mean, come on. We, yeah. we barely had the internet. Right. I had like dial up AOL. <laughs> That's all I am. Yeah. So to conceptualize this life is impossible. Yeah. And I think it's really hard when you're in the moment yeah. of being Cowboy Curtis. Yes. To understand this is a stop along the way. Absolutely. That's all. And, and it is so valuable. So valuable. The stops along the way and the pieces that you learn from those stops form you into that matrix person. Absolutely. You couldn't be matrix without Cowboy Curtis. Absolutely not. And, and, you know, it's been interesting because so my fiance has like a a corporate legal job, Mm -hmm. hates it, miserable time. Mm -hmm. So he's going down more traditional path and I'm like not. And I think Part of that has to do with the fact that I watched my dad's career advance in so many different ways. And Mm -hmm. so I understand that, like, everything is experience, right? Like, you know, the comedy writing and the MFA and all that. It all culminates in this larger thing Mm -hmm. and no experience is moot. And I feel like in this time period, it is so possible to make a creative choice to do something unconventional, Mm -hmm. but it just requires sort of that leap of faith Mm -hmm. to do it. And like, for me, obviously like, you know, jumping into the, the Dr. Drew pool, like that's a safe pool to jump in, you know? Um, but I think it's about finding sort of the shallow pools first and then Uh moving your way to the deep end. Um, and so I don't know, I feel, I feel so lucky that to have been part of this project and I feel like it's been it's been really transformational to talk about all these topics in a public way. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, it's it's been a wild ride. That's for sure. It's been a weird two months. It's only like only been two months. <laughs> Has it only been two months? Yeah. Oh, my maybe, gosh. It was October 17th when it came out. What? Or sorry, maybe 21st. Somewhere around there. Somewhere You're around right. There. Mm-hmm. Gosh, it seems like forever. I know. It does. It seems I thought you were here in the summer. I don't know why, because now that you say that, I go, well, yeah, it was just October. It had to be. LA is always warm. Well, I'm so happy for you that this, 
I'm so happy to talk to somebody who has a realistic point of view about life, right? That it's not that exactly what you just said is such a beautiful way. And I hope people who listen, who are your age can take that to heart because, you know, none of us start out in the deep end. And when you do, you usually end up drowning or struggling or floundering. Burnout bright, you know? Yeah, totally. It's, um, I don't know. I think longevity is, um, is an interesting thing because not many people can maintain it Mm -hmm. in certain ways. Um, and I, I don't know. It's like, I've been doing so much stuff with my dad, so I have him as a model, but Mm -hmm. it's like, he's evolved with each stage of his career in in a way that I like, I admire where Mm -hmm. I'm just like, okay, like it is about kind of doing it project by project and Mm -hmm. always playing to the height of your intelligence Mm -hmm. and, you know, being, uh, being open and receptive and empathetic. And, you know, it comes down to the trust, compassion and boundaries, you know, it does. It's, um, it does. It's applicable everywhere. Yeah, it really is. It is. I explained TCB to uh, our daughters Uh and my youngest daughter is so interesting. She's so very bright. They both are, but she, she processes things in such a deep way that she changed some of her friendships. I think based on the conversations that we had Whoa. about TCB because wow. she started evaluating people and going, I don't actually have that there. I don't have boundaries. I have boundaries that are not respected. Yep. I, I, I don't trust because my boundaries aren't respected. So what am I doing here? Yeah. I think she took, she, she took stock of what's what she had wow. and what that meant. She's such an interesting little nugget. Um, when you think she's not listening, she comes back and she goes, so I've decided. And I go, ah, you decided to take a break from that person. (laughs) Wow. You're only 15. Wow. That's impressive. for 15. She's 15. I didn't think like that at 15. No, me neither. (laughs) I thought about boys, boys and boys. Nonstop. (laughs) Nonstop. That's all I thought of. Me too. Boys and cheerleading. That was it. Yeah. Sugar skating for me. Yeah. There you go. There you go. So. Yes, that that is a great book. Anyway, we've already <laughs> talked about the book. I am <laughs> enough with that. Thing. Not enough, but it's it's never left the spot. By the way, so really? No, it stays right here. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I don't want to move it. I'm so I like truly. It's so moving. Like book writing is sort of like my passion. It's what I want to do. I want to write a memoir. As you were saying, like I always imagine the first thing being the memoir, and that's going to launch my whole career. And it's like, no, we got to work towards that. Yeah. And this has been one of the most beautiful, enriching experiences I've ever had. And to know that it's touched you and your your family and your friends and everything. It's just, it's, it's surreal. It's not surreal. just me. No, I'm sure it's not just me. I'm sure it's not just me that it's touched and touched the families. It's, it can't be because it's such a great, little toolkit. Um, I, um, I admire your dad so much. It must be hard to have a a dad in the spotlight. I think about that a lot with my kids because they're, although not the same dad by any stretch, it is a similar spotlight. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you think that affected you when you were younger? Or do you mind if I ask? No, this? I love. Th- I'm, okay. This is like what my memoir is about. It's like about sort of like my proximity to celebrity and mm-hmm. the ways in which like it shaped shifted over the course of my life. Because mm-hmm. when I was a kid, my dad was doing like local radio. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when I was very little, he was gone a lot because he was, you know, working, you know, seeing 60 patients a day and, wow. you know, both at like his father's private practice that he inherited and the rehab loss in Cenas where he was chief of staff and he was doing rounds at Huntington hospital. And then he was doing love line, uh, 9 PM to midnight, five, five or six nights a week. Wow. So he was working like insane hours, like 17 hour days. Mm. And so, um, when we were really little, the sort of like extent of like the fame was like, K Rock would have uh, different concerts, so they would have the the Weenie Rose, the Acoustic Christmas, the Inland Invasion, and I think that's it. And we would have to show up and like be there for Dad's work. And mm. so the setting of sort of uh, our childhood was like backstage at concerts, mm-hmm. and so like a lot of like you know tattooed 
tongue piercing people would be like, you know, listen to your father. He's a good man. And I was like, okay, like my entire life, that's like all I ever heard. Right. And so then as we got older, then he started doing more TV and sloppy rehab happened. And then he was out of the house. Like he was always working. So he was always out of the house. Right. And it wasn't until we got to college that it kind of like became um, more tangible. Cause like when we were kids, it was like, Oh, you're going to the American Idol recording or we're going to big brother or whatever. And it was like this fun thing. Sure. Um, but then when he got his HLN gig, I have this very specific memory of production group coming to our house and they were filming like promo stuff. And my parents were like, it's going to be an hour. Like, don't worry about it. It was six hours. Oh my gosh. And they made us do this one bit where they taped up all of the empty boxes in our house and they pulled my mom's like SUV that I drew up, drove up in <laughs> and we each had to like load the car. Like my brothers and I, it was like, we're empty nesters because we were leaving for college that year. And so like I loaded the car and then I walked away and then Jordan unloaded my boxes and then he loaded his boxes and then Douglas came and unloaded Jordan's boxes and then loaded his boxes. We spent like an hour and a half on that. Wow. And then it ended when I ended up seeing the promo, it was like a th- like a three second transition. And I was mm. just like oh, I'm a pawn in this sort of like scheme of like projecting this perfect family so that dad can be like a date, like a, a, you know, a nightly news guy, you know? And so it was sort of this like, oh, we're old enough where they're not protecting us from this anymore. Mm -hmm. And now I'm understanding sort of the the expectation that we're like this normal, healthy family. Um, Meanwhile, I'm like 18. I haven't even come to terms with my eating disorder at all. Mm -hmm. Um. And so when I went to college, that's like the first year that HLN, the 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 Dr. Drew on call show started. Um, and that sort of just like kind of catapulted him to sort of like. A different reco- Yeah, like people recognized yeah. him on the street more. Right, and right. like it wasn't just like this L.A. thing, because mm-hmm. when I went to college, I would be like, <sighs> like I tell a story and they'd be like, wait, what? wait, why did you meet Tony Hawk? You know, like whatever it was. And I'd be like, well, like, do you know who Dr. Drew is? And they'd be like, what? And I'd be like, um, how do I explain this? Not Dr. Phil, not Dr. Oz looks like Anderson Cooper. (laughs) And they're like, oh yeah, like I've seen that guy. I'm like, slow to rehab. And they're like, "Mm." I'm like, teen mom reunions. And they're like, oh yeah, you know? (laughs) So it's like, I was able to sort of leave it and kind of forge my own identity Mm -hmm. and that like, yeah, I stopped figure skating. I joined the rugby team. I like pierced my nose, you know, all these things that like I needed to do in order to sort of differentiate myself. Sure. Um, but like I have this one specific memory of my dad like visiting me on campus and we were walking. I went to Barnard and Barnard is the Women's College of Columbia mm-hmm. and it's literally across the street from Columbia's campus. Mm-hmm. And so I walked him through Barnard's campus and like no one said anything. And then I walked him across to Columbia And I just remember this one person being like, oh, my God, Dr. Drew. And didn't like they were in one of my classes. They like I kind of knew them, but they did not acknowledge me like they just Mm. didn't even acknowledge me. And I was like, oh, when I am in proximity to him, I don't matter. Like I am invisible. I'm invisible. I am. Hey, can you take the picture? Hey, can you step away? You know, it's like it's never it's my mom likes to say it's like being uh it's being like being with mickey mouse at disneyland (laughs) right and so like if we can't walk through times square like Mm -hmm. you know it's like there's places that we don't go Mm -hmm. he's not beyonce you know yeah yeah and i say i yeah i understand bad for beyonce you know it's like can't go anywhere can't go anywhere and people feel and this is sort of the moment in which i understood that people when they recognize you they feel like they have ownership over Mm -hmm. you And, you know, people I remember I was walking down the Upper West Side with my dad and we were like, you know, we went to Manhattan Diner and had corned beef hash. And it was like, you know, father daughter bonding. We're walking up the street and this huge muscly guy comes out. and He's like, hey, Dr. Drew, what's up? Oh, I have some questions. I'm taking these steroids. And like my dad, like, I don't know, Joan Rivers always had um, the saying that, like, you're always working. Right. Like, Mm -hmm. even if you're in the bathroom, you haven't washed your hands, you're still working. Right. And I think that my dad is very much in that school of thought Mm -hmm. of like you're always on call, you know? Yeah. And I resent that. (laughs) I think there should be boundaries. I think that people, um, just because you recognize someone and you know of someone does not know, mean you know them. Right. Right. And I, and I think that's sort of the problem of our era is that now 
with social media, we all feel like we have proximity to these people. We feel like we can just do anything at them because we can. Mm -hmm. And that is not healthy boundaries, you know, and it's not conducive. Like it's not healthy for either party. Right. Both the person receiving and the person who's like, you, you know, spewing. Right. Um, it is very difficult. And uh, we are very similar. Yeah. Just recently. Yeah. Gotten very similar. Yeah. And it is hard. I watch Georgia not enjoy it. Yeah. And and Bert's very aware of her not enjoying it. And at the same time, what are the choices that you make that you never go anywhere ever with your yeah. daughter? And you... He is the same school of thought of your dad. Yeah. You're always working. Yep. These are the people that are actually putting you through college yeah. because they're buying a ticket. Yeah. So you can't be a jerk. That's not okay. Yeah. And you'd like to hold the boundary, but you can't hold the boundary because yeah. the other person is not holding a boundary. Yeah. And then now you're an asshole if you if you don't. And yeah. then now you're an asshole to your daughter. Yeah. It's so complicated. And heartbreaking it's It's really hard it's hard because it's also like so exciting for the person yes right it's Mm -hmm. like you're this person that i've listened to for years Mm -hmm. and i like feel like i know you and it's like yes you're working so you have to say yes i hear you i see you Mm -hmm. but then for the family member it's like you didn't hear him fart in the car like (laughs) you weren't there yes you know i think that is would be not so much a bird yeah because bird is like Warts and all. Yeah. Everybody knows about all his warts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But nobody knows about Drew's warts. But he has them because he's a human being. Yeah. I don't even know about Drew's warts, but I know that he's human. He's And all humans have them. He has perfectionist tendencies. And then they're surprised that I had perfectionist tendencies. (laughs) Right. Uh, Apple doesn't fall far. <laughs> yeah. Apple doesn't fall far. And yeah. he does fart in the car. He does. You know, uh, he does. who doesn't <laughs> fart in the Every, car? Everyone. And pick their nose sometimes. Everyone should. You know, ev- exactly. So I think that's so hard. It must be really hard. I, I look at Bert with a lot of compassion because yeah. nobody, unless I'm with Bert, nobody recognizes me. Yeah. So I'm still super autonomous and I get all the perks of his fame. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, but I go, God, it's, I would be so frustrated if it took me an hour and a half to get through the airport. Oh. I would be so frustrated. And I would not be nearly as gracious as he is. At a certain point, I'd be like, can I just get to my gate? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But he never does it. And it's got to be hard to be the kid of that. But it's also know? like, uh, I think there is an element of ego in it, right? A hundred percent. Oh, I'm being stopped because I'm so wonderful. A hundred percent. Yes, I changed your life, you know? Yes. It's yeah. it's definitely a pat on the back. Yeah. That you have accomplished something. Yeah. And, you know, ego, yes. But I know I read all of Bert's fan emails. Yeah. And I am amazed at how many people who say I was suicidal. Wow. And I started binge watching your specials and it pulled me out of it. Wow. I have PTSD. I was not getting any help from therapy. I watched all your specials and suddenly I started getting help in therapy. Wow. I, I, my mother died and I couldn't deal with my emotions. And so I put on secret time and I just laughed for a full day. Wow. And you go, well, that is, that is what you want to have happen. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure your dad has had the same effect on so many people. I mean, it's interesting because so for a while, so the first uh, this so the the sort of first time my social media grew was when um, I wrote a essay in college mm-hmm. called "Get Your Teeth Checked" <laughs> in the Columbia Spectator about telling my mom about my bulimia for the first time. Oh my god! And, okay, I yeah. need to hear about this. Yeah, so because this is why I had you yes, here. Yes, was to talk about eating disorders. Eating disorders. And, 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 here but, we go. But I have to tell you, thank you for sharing your feelings about your dad because Georgia will listen to this podcast. And know that you feel what she feels. Mm -hmm. And perhaps someday, if she needs an ear, maybe she could talk to you. Absolutely. Because you are older. She's only 17. You've you've been through college. She's about to start. And we went to tour colleges with Bert, and it was a mob scene. Oh, boy. And so she and I just separated yep. and went off and looked. Yep. And she kept saying, I just wish Dad could be here, too. Yeah. And unfortunately, that's not the dynamic we're in at the moment. Yeah. And it breaks my heart for both of them. Yeah. Because Bert really, 
wanted to experience that moment with Georgia mm. and couldn't. Yeah. And she really wanted her dad and couldn't have him. That's hard. And it stinks. And at the same time, there's an awareness that this is why we are able to send her to college. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is the this is the family business. So thank you for talking about that for a minute. Honestly, because, honor and a privilege. Like, I, well, I really think so, because I the more I get asked about it, the more important I think it is. And like, you know, there will be the people that are like this privileged bitch. Blah, 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 blah. And it's course, like, yes, I somebody's am always got bitch. something yes. to say. Somebody always got something. Yeah. To say something. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I recognize my privilege. I constantly think about my privilege. I constantly think about like how I can use my privilege to help other people. Sure. Um, and also how to dismantle that privilege at the same time. But also it's like, I'm part of this superstructure. Like we are on the spaceship and like, I can't take out a window anymore, you know, or yeah. we're all going to die, which totally. maybe is more about my psychology than anything. But, um, so I wrote this essay, yeah. um, get your teeth checked. And it was about bulimia recovery. It was about intergenerational body trauma. It was about my relationship with Whoa. my mother. What is intergenerational body trauma? What is so that? So the way I sort of um, wrote about it in the essay was sort of the way like inherited uh, like diet trauma or feminine trauma, right? So like okay. in my family, like food restriction and like diet and exercise, we kind of like say like diet and exercise is our religion or whatever. Right. Um, but I think sort of like the hyper feminine ideal and sort of this... Um, you know, I, I really believe that like femininity and like feminine training is kind of a form of trauma in its own way. Uh, yeah. And I I kind of like could see a lineage from like my grandmother to my mother to me. And, you know, for me, it was, you know, in college, I identified that I was throwing up and I was like, well, now that I've been taken out of my normal context, like this seems weird. Yeah. Um, And so when I started recovery, it was very much with the aim of sort of healing feminine trauma in my family. And I think that like really had to do with food. Mm -hmm. um, and so the hook of the essay was me telling my mom, like, you know, I've been throwing up for years, whatever. And so the only thing she said back was, well, get your teeth checked. And so that was the hook of the essay. Great hook for an essay. Horrible when taken out of context, which ended up happening six months later when the New York Post took that quote and it went viral. Wow. And, you know, I, Get Your Teeth Check was the first essay I had ever published. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine asked me to write it. It was really well received within the college community. Um, and, you know, at the time, um, so I was a competitive figure skater growing mm -hmm. up. And eating disorders are sort of like in the fabric of the culture itself, right? Mm -hmm. It's like a friend of mine was hospitalized for anorexia in the third grade. And that was what? just, yeah. In the third grade? Mm -hmm. She's eight. I know. Oh, my God. And that was just kind of like, oh, yeah, anorexic, you know. Oh, can you blip that name? Yeah, blip, right. blip that name out. Um, And, you know, I would walk into the rink and they'd be like, you gained weight, you know. And at a certain point, like, I had to decide whether I was going to lose weight and stay in the sport or I was going to quit. And so you know, this sport that became like was, you know, my passion and kind of helped me individuate myself. And it was, you know, performance outlet um, became sort of a job and mm. obligation. And so around the sixth grade, I went to a nutritionist, um, a woman who had worked with my dad for years. Um, and I hold a lot of resentment towards her. Really? Absolutely. Because she she didn't work with children. She worked with old adults and i think when you when you mess with what children eat and you apply an adult framework to a child's growing body mm -hmm. that is only going to yield disordered eating mm. she was essentially giving me disordered eating techniques no way in order yeah absolutely it was like you know the early 2000s it was like 100 calorie packs and like you know light string cheese and it's like you know i everything was methodical i i would get weighed every week i would go to her every week um, and so I went from her to her, uh, ages 12 to 18. Um, and I, you know, every week she'd tell me what to eat. I would buy exactly what she told me to buy. I would eat exactly as she told me to buy, uh, to eat as she told me to eat. Um, and you know, it just, it became sort of this like psychotic, well-oiled machine where like, 
when I, by the time I got to high school, I was pretty good at ice skating because I, you know, was 120 pounds and like didn't eat anything. Right. Um, and you've been doing it for years. For years. Yeah. I mean, I did it for 13 years. That's a long time. Really long time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it got to the point where like my childhood nanny would deliver Zanku chicken to me at school. It would be double meat, no rice, no hummus, no pita, double salad. I would eat half of it for lunch and then half of it for dinner. And that was like what I did. Wow. And I would drink six Diet Cokes a day. And it's like, okay, this is health. <laughs> this is right. No, and not, not very balanced. No, not at all. No. And so the reason I brought up my brother is because um, when I told him I was doing this podcast, he was like, do you want to like read the DSM-5? He was like, I have you like looked at the definitions recently? And I was like, no, I haven't. And so I did. And obviously there's a wide range of eating disorders. From I printed them out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I did. Pika rumination. Yes. yes. Anorexia, bulimia, yes. and then non-specified eating disorder. And then there's one more. Binge eating. Oh, binge eating. Yep. Binge eating. Binge eating. Yep. And so what was fascinating to me is like, I, what I don't understand about the anorexia di diagnosis is that there has to be a BMI component to it. And that like, I never was low enough to be detectable, but I was for sure anorexic. Like I kind of was like anorexic, bulimic kind of you know, that little song and dance. Uh, like, okay, so hold on. Before we go further. Yeah. Let me just read these so anybody listening yes. understands what they are. Okay. Any disorders may be caused by several factors. These include genetics, brain biology, personality traits, and cultural ideals. Um, I, the source for this is helpline.com. Gorgeous. Um, anorexia nervosa. People with anorexia nervosa may limit their food intake or compensate for it through various purging behaviors. They have an intense fear of gaining weight, even when severely underweight. Mm -hmm. So that's what you had. So for a lot of um, sort of treatment centers, mm -hmm. they will not accept you unless you're under a certain BMI. Are and, you kidding? Yeah. And then if you gain the weight back, back, they're like, okay, you can go. That does not make sense. It's not good. At all. No. That's like majority of eating disorder treatment that I've heard about. That does not even, that seems egregious. I know. It is. That doesn't make sense at all. It's, I, it's a lot. It's, when it comes to specifically, I think, anorexia, mm -hmm. there seems to be sort of this fixation on sort of like recapitulating the problem. So it's like, oh, you're underweight? We're going to get you of weight, right? Or... Mm -hmm oh, you have all these rituals around food. Now we're going to kind of give you new rituals around food. And it's like, no, let's talk about like their childhood trauma. Totally. Let's talk about like what their family like life is like. Like right. what is going on under the surface that these behaviors are uh, motivating? That's right. Yeah. And yeah, I just like the BMI component really pisses me off because it's just like, even though, so in middle school, I was like probably more of like an anorexia flavor of eating disorder, which uh -huh. is a weird way to say eating disorders are flavors, <laughs> flavor. but, you but know, I'm like flavor. Um, <laughs> and then it kind of slowly kind of merged into bulimia. Mm -hmm. um, so bulimia is yes. people with bulimia nervosa eat large amounts of food in short periods of time, then purge. They fear gaining weight despite being at a normal weight. Mm -hmm. So bulimia is less dependent on BMI, right? It's like, mm -hmm. okay, you're of weight, you're vomiting, there's a clear problem. Right. Um, but I feel like, so I was really lucky in that um, I found a therapist who kind of was unconventional in her methods and that feminism was sort of the, the central tenet of it. And mm -hmm. it wasn't about like, it wasn't about eating. It was about health at every size. It was about intuitive eating. It was about like talk therapy, talking mm -hmm. about family, talking about culture, talking about trauma, all that. Um, and I'm so grateful for that because had that not been the case, I don't think that I would have had such a um, both profound revolution of self, but also like an intellectual kind of understanding of what I was experiencing, why I was experiencing it, and how sort of the the coping mechanism existed in order to make me functional, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And I think in my house, there was a lot of um, focus on perfection mm -hmm. and performance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was going to a really intense, you know, college prep school and I was on the cheer team and I was on the dance and I was ice skating and I was the co-president of the girls service. Like I was 
doing everything sort of in the model of my father. Right. I was trying to do it all, do it all like mm-hmm. he does. 17 hour work day. Exactly. Right. And, you know, I got to college and I mean, first of all, I was like, <laughs> oh, like goodbye everybody um uh, right but i also was taken out of my context for the mm-hmm. first time and so i remember being in the dining hall and like watching people put food on their plate seemingly with ease and i was just like i don't know how to feed myself wow because from ages 12 to 18 someone told me exactly what to eat right you know whether that was a cup of you know sugar-free fruit loops or half of a think thin bar or you know just that's we, really intense it was that's really a lot to put on a teenager oh yeah to, i mean that kind of your i completely see your point that this nutritionist was applying adult rules or patterns or rituals mm-hmm. to a child yep and that's too much responsibility it's way too much well, for a child it's like how does that not manifest an eating disorder it, it can't it can't not it if it at the least it would manifest a, a hyper focus on food that is never healthy. You I, know, anytime you sort of, I mean, here's the thing. I really think that like it should be more about addition than subtra- subtraction, right? When it comes to food, it's like what feels good to you. What mm-hmm. do you like to? Eat? What makes you feel good when you eat it, right? Mm-hmm. Like when I got to college and I came into intuitive eating, I would literally like eat a spicy tofu pad thai every day because I had never been allowed to do that. Right. But, you know, a week of doing that, I was like, this hurts. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, yeah, yeah. doesn't feel good. Too much. And it's almost like basically you had to sort of, or what I had to do was sort of be in that extreme zone and do those extreme things to sort of lift the taboo of whatever that food held. Yes. Like there is no bad food. There's also no good food. It's just food. It's just food. And so I think because food became so restricted and moralized Mm -hmm. in my childhood, I had to sort of neutralize it and gorge myself in a certain way. And that didn't last very long. Sure. Um, But it's the pendulum swing. It is. The the pendulum was way to the to the right and you had to swing it all the way to the left so you could find the middle. Absolutely. I understand that totally. My mom. Yeah. I believe my mom has personality disorder. Okay. Of course, people with personality disorders don't think there's anything wrong with them. Yep. So they don't get diagnosed. Yeah. So she's never been diagnosed. Yeah. But everything I've read and understand about them, she fits the bill, in my opinion. Yeah. When I was a kid, I had to take 21 vitamins every day. I had to drink niacin from time to time. I had a completely clean and healthy diet. No sugar, no processed foods. Yep. Nothing bad at all. And then I would go, my parents were divorced. I'd go to my dad's house. We would like in the car, stop at McDonald's and then stop at a convenience store and load up on every form of sugar known to man yep. and eat like shit the whole weekend yep. and then go back into this highly regimented, highly regulated food, vitamin, supplement, meditation pattern. Wow. And I never developed an eating disorder. I developed a drinking problem. Uh, so same thing. Oh, absolutely. It's the same thing. My coping mechanism was just not food. Yep. It was booze. Yep. So I totally understand what you're talking about when it is. And I was seven when that started. Wow. From seven to 13. And at 13, I moved back with my dad and then just ate like shit constantly. Yeah. Because (laughs) I could. Yeah. Uh, But that high regulation, that intensity that's put on food and nutrition and it's just not good. It's too much for a kid's little psyche. Well, it you doesn't. Can't pro- he wants. We're talking about eating disorders. He, oh yeah, we are. Turn me on, Austin. <laughs> he asked me if he could crash our podcast, and I completely forgot that until he just walked in the door, or I would have. Okay. Uh, so I would have. Uh, I would have warned you. No, I no, totally no, no. I forgot. Like so, what's the difference between an eating disorder and a diet? Because I can't find the difference right now. I. I'm actively anti-diet, personally. Oh. Um, I, Can I tell you what I'm pro? And you're going to f- think this is fucking ridiculous? Tell me. I'm pro coming out as fat. Are you being serious? Yeah. I love that mentality of going, hey, I need everyone to stop looking at me and judging me because that fucks my head up. Yeah. And this is who I am. And I don't want to hear anything. And and if and if And if you... I, this is it's so problematic to say 
But if if you have concerns about me, shut your fucking mouth. Let me, my, I hope I'm not sharing too much secrets and stop me if I am. My daughter has um, some pimples, you know, she, yeah. has, she has acne. Yeah. Not, I mean, acne. Yeah. As a parent, I, I want to say to her, hey, should we go to a dermatologist and take, that, take care of that? But I don't want to fuck with her head because she may not notice it. Yeah. And I don't want to plant that seed in her head. And it, it's a tough job as a parent to sit there and say, hey, I'm not going to say anything, you know, but I'm like, but, but it's fucked me up because, and I, I mean this honestly, my dad really, it, we would have vacation, we would have trips and correct me if I'm wrong, but we'd have trips where our happiness would depend on my weight. Mm. Well, we were just talking about this. Sounds like What's my it called? Family. Generational uh, body trauma. Well, generational intergenerational body, trauma. body trauma. Well, you're, I mean, you're fucked because your dad's a doctor. <laughs> I know. So like, so like anything he says, he can stand behind the wall of going, listen, I'm a clinical physician. I do this is what I do for a living. Yeah. You need to listen to me. I mean, I, I can't imagine. I, yeah, mean, but- I know Drew's a very sensitive dude. So I'm not, I'm not shitting on Drew, but yeah. I know for a fact that like I've had conversations with him about everything in my life and the last thing he is, he's very direct. Yes. He's very direct. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the only, the one thing that I remember him saying to me as a child, he was never, he never commented, which I appreciate. My mom did full, full reign, no censor there. But uh, this is the one sort of memory of my dad uh, saying something to me. And it wasn't about my weight. Uh, we were in the Rome airport and he's, he got next to me and he was like, you smell like mothballs and B.O. And I was like 13. I was like, no, I don't. It's fine. It's fine. And then I was like, he's right. So all this is to say when it comes to the pimples, I think it has to do with approach, right? Like shame is never a good tactic. No. And when it comes to weight, everyone's main tactic is shame. Totally. Because they think, yeah. well, you should be this, yeah. right? You should be able to control yourself. Yeah. Or you should be thinner or you should look better or a- absolutely. you should take better care of your uh, your health. You yeah. should, you should, you should. Or or some people said other stuff sometimes. Oh, shut up. Uh-oh. What, you want to just go to a fat farm? Well, no, he was telling me. I have a real, I have a real, I, I'm, I'm sharing this. Thanks for throwing that out and not letting me explain. Go it. ahead, go ahead. He was telling me he thought he needed to talk to a doctor about the way yeah. that he that he needed to go to rehab for food. I said they used to call those fat farms. That's not exactly. That what is you... exactly what I said. They used to call those fat farms. Are you saying you want to go to a fat farm? That's what I said, and I said a it. Fat farm, so jokingly, but he did not. Well, I was. <laughs> he heard fat farm, and he was like, he heard fat farm, <laughs> and my wife thinks I'm a fat fuck, and now she's divorcing me, and she hates me, <laughs> oh. and now she thinks I'm not sexy, and all no, I, I was I, said it I as think, a joke. So. I think what an insensitive. Happened joke what, what happened to me and i'd be interested to hear your dad's your dad's thought on this is that i realized uh i realized i'm doing this cleanse right now which is fucking totally unhealthy are you I'm, shitting your pants no i'm not i'm not even shitting and i'm not doing it right i haven't been boiling the soups so i've been eating grainy hard d de- he's non, been steeping non instead de- of boiling. Hi- non-dehydrated <laughs> soups so i fucking haven't even enjoyed it but i've been sticking with it but i realized that i'd i'd heard your dad talk about and it's interesting. I'm using your dad because of addiction, but you're, I've heard your dad talk about addiction, and and he's always said you're not an alcoholic, and I, and I've always wondered if I got one by him or if he was if if he was accurate. Mm. And then I realized I, I'm not, I'm not helpless to alcohol. I, I'm definitely not. I have could, I will and could and do quit drinking whenever I choose. I just, my lifestyle is set up and my business is set up that drinking is a part of it and I really enjoy it and have a good time. And I keep it under wraps. I, when I quit drinking, I'm not shaking. I'm not, there's no detox. It's literally uh, just quit drinking. And so, um, but in doing this cleanse, I realized that that word helpless, that I am helpless to food, mm. that, I, that I have many times done things in an airport. I sat in the Chicago airport one time I got eight cheeseburgers and I took the buns. I figured I wanted four cheeseburgers, but I figured if I took half the buns off, then that would be roughly the equivalent of four cheeseburgers. So I got eight. And then I I, I hid in a phone booth, a broken phone booth. I stuck my head in there and I ate. Oh my four God. Cheese- okay. I understand. I understand. Yeah. That's why I say I'm helpless to food. Yeah. I've, things like that happen to me. Like I've never once gone through the Chicago airport and not gotten a Chicago hot dog. I've never once. Uh, been in New York and not gotten a, a Grace Papaya hot dog. Like, the, 
I've never once been to New York and not gotten pizza. I've never, like, like there are certain things where I go, I am actually kind of helpless to food. Mm. And and it may be Leanne saying that right now it may be where my brain is with how much I'm working yeah. and that this is a, a, a like a, an outlet. Mm -hmm. but I, there are times like, I'll wake up from a nap and if I get a nap, I want sugar. I have eaten four candy bars and then I'm just like, I feel sick. What did I do? Yeah. I have no control over it. And so I was sharing that with her and I was saying, oh my God, like the, the dialogue I've always heard about addiction is first step, admit you are, you're, you're helpless. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, that's what's going on with me and food. Like we had, we had uh, a, a woman, a woman, uh, Chef Antonia, she has Scopa restaurant, all these great restaurants, but she catered to dinner here when I was on my fast. And I swear to you, I was, I was reach, I, I knew I wasn't supposed to eat it. I would find my hand just reach to get a bite and I couldn't stop it. It would just reach. I go, what are you doing? Like, well, weren't you restricting to the point of starving? Like, yeah, yeah. F roughly 700 calories. Yeah. A day. See, when you restrict the obvious, you know, sort of repercussion of that is gorging, right? Because your body is starving. And so your brain is saying, I need to get as much as possible so that the next time I starve, I will survive. And so yeah. that's why I don't believe in dieting because I think, you know, there's, there's, you know, there are studies going back to the fifties that say 95, 90, more than that, do, diets don't work. You always end up gaining the, the weight that you lose yeah. because you're usually doing it through restrictive measures. Yeah. You're, you're not, it's not something that you're going to continue your entire life. Right. And so, you know, I mean, for me, like I, I think when I hear that, I feel like you're moralizing food, right? You're saying hot dogs are bad, pizza is bad, cheeseburgers are bad, right? Yeah, they are. They are. Taco but, Bell's bad. Hold on, let's. That, but that, that, but can I tell you, I, I when I start dieting or when I start trying to eat healthy, I look at things like In and Out, and I guess I, I go, I guess I'll never have that again because you're not allowed to. Or I, I see people eat ice cream cones, and I go, what world do they live in where they get to eat ice cream cones? Because <laughs> I, I used to say, I can't. I I I. I can't imagine a grown man eating an ice cream cone. And then I did it with Leanne. She goes, you want to go out on a I date? I took him out on a date. Aww. And, and we had ice cream and we I fucking loved cones. it. And I was like, this is great. But then when I get done, I go, I shouldn't have had that. Well, see that there's so much morality tied in, right? It's so much about should and should not do. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I mean, like I, I, this resonates with me a lot because I feel like, as I was telling you, Leanne, like when I first started eating disorder recovery and I started doing intuitive eating, um, it, it was a lot of sort of taking the morality out of food. What's intuitive eating? I'm sorry, you, and, I'm sure you already uh, talked about No, I, I no. haven't really talked about it. Um, so intuitive eating is just sort of the idea of, you know, eating when you're hungry, stopping when you're full, sort of like, and it's hard. It's who, super hard. Who, and who teaches you that? <laughs> <laughs> Your intuition. Well, there's workbooks. For real? Yeah, there's intuitive eating workbooks. I'm getting one now. Yeah, it's awesome. And there's um, an amazing book, um, Health at Every Size by Dr. Lindo Bacon. Mm -hmm. um, they also His have- last name's Bacon. Yeah, isn't that good? <laughs> isn't that good? And then Body Respect is sort of like the Health at Every Size sort of light version. So if you're, if you're looking for sort of the science of food, Health at Every Size, if you're looking for sort of like anti-diet culture, intuitive eating, Health at Every Size sort of ideology, Body Respect is a better place. But with intuitive eating, yes, there's workbooks. There's also probably therapists that help you with that. But for me, I like, and it's something that I still am managing, you know, like I am 200 plus pounds. I am like the heaviest person in my family. Everyone in my family is thin and fit and like really cares about looking a specific way. And like part of that is like, you know, society. Part of that is job. Part of that is living in Southern California and that my mom was a bikini model. You know, it's like all these things. And so I forgot you. I, when you said my mom, I forgot who your mom is. And then I just remembered who your mom is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And it's like, and I was a competitive figure skater growing up. And so like all of those things are in my head, but you know, I'm, you know, I'm working out, I'm eating in the way that it feels good to me, you know? And, and there's so many things that I, I'm now determining for myself without thinking about like what it looks like, what it sounds like, whatever it is. It's like no one else is involved in what is going into my body. Right. Yeah. No one else. And like, if I want to have an ice cream cone, I'll have an ice cream cone. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the ice cream cone, you're going to fixate on it for three weeks and then you're going to eat three pints of ice cream. I'm fixating on, um, I'm fixating on Thursday morning. 
Because I, I finish this cleanse when I, I, I you just, can't just jump back in and eat burgers. You no, gotta, so so yeah, I, that's I not talked good to my trainer and my trainer said she thinks the best thing for me to be go to a paleo friendly diet. She's like, don't limit yourself to paleo. But if if the more green and protein you can eat and the more you can stay away from inflammatory foods, mm. when she was saying dairy and Dairy is my favorite. I know dairy is my favorite too. Well, you know, bread here's... is such a great delivery mechanism. <laughs> like to get something into your mouth, bread is such a great concierge. It is to get things in your mouth. Yeah. I mean, and it's delicious. I could, it is. I could write oh. poetry about food right now. I'm listen. I'll read it. Well, I was just saying this to Kathy. I had a podcast earlier today, and I was like, you know, I started working out with a trainer almost two years ago. Mm -hmm. And I did that for several reasons. One was because I wasn't happy with the way my body looked. Mm -hmm. One was because I was having back issues. Mm -hmm. And one was because I was having trouble getting up out of the floor. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I am losing strength yep. and I'm not okay with that. Yeah. So yesterday I was looking at myself in the mirror. And when I started with him, I was eating lean protein and greens only all day, every day, which really is unsustainable for all of life. Mm -hmm. But I dropped 20 pounds, yep. right? I've gained 15 back, but I don't look like I gained 15 back. I look in the mirror and I go, actually, I look pretty fit with a little fluff. And I'm actually okay with that because yeah. I'm 51 and I'm fit. So yesterday I ran on the elliptical or ran whatever you call it on the elliptical at a pretty high speed for 12 minutes, got off of that and ran on the treadmill at a fairly high speed for another 12 minutes Wow! and wasn't super crazy winded. And I went, that's all I should be focused on. Yeah. Yeah. All that should matter is that I am fit and healthy. Well, how it feels and right? how I feel. Mm -hmm. I feel, I feel great. Yeah. Now, am I going to put a bikini on? No, I am not. I am not going to walk around in a bikini. Well, I think all bodies are bikini bodies if you so choose. Well, uh, I, I think that. I, I think all bodies are speedo bodies. I think yeah. that is very healthy, and yeah. I think that is not where my brain is. What's but crazy? I think that's is I, very healthy. Well, I also, I mean, it's interesting because I feel like um, in Hollywood and Southern California, all these things like women aren't allowed to age, and they're expected to be sex objects until mm -hmm. they die, mm -hmm. and. I'm not interested in that personally. Right, right. Like at 60, I'm going to be like wearing moo moos and crazy jewelry and like, I don't know, probably running seances or something. I don't know. <laughs> That'll be fun. But there's just, there's, there's sort of this expectation that you're supposed to like flaunt yourself always. Right. And I, I, I both believe that all bodies are bikini bottle bodies, but I also think it has to do with what your comfort level is and yeah. whether or not you want to be on display. Yeah. No, I don't want to be in a bikini. Yeah. And you know, my mom, like your mom, yeah. my mom was a, very successful model. She was runway model in Italy. She was wow. the highest paid model in Atlanta for about nine years. Wow. And she did a lot of bikini. And her body looked like Cher. Yeah. That's what, and she ate nothing, yep. you know, and she looked like freaking Cher. In no world will I ever look like Cher. Yeah. And I don't need to look like Cher, but I'm also not comfortable being a bikini for me, not looking like Cher. Mm. So I'm just going to stay in my one piece and enjoy myself. <laughs> well, it's interesting. Like you kind of raise an interesting point that I think about all the time where it's like, we have sort of these models of what we're supposed to look like. Yes. And like because of the proliferation of social media and plastic surgery, mm -hmm. we can now actually sculpt ourselves into looking like that person. Right. And so what we're seeing is sort of a homogenization of aesthetic where everyone, everyone has a Brazilian butt lift. Everybody has lip fillers. Everybody's got cheek, cheek implants. Right. 10 years from now, it's going to be the exact opposite. Totally, totally. And it's 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 both like, I, I guess it could be seen as sort of this liberating thing of like, oh, I can shape my body into looking like that. But I think what's more radical and exciting is accepting who you are, what yeah. you look like, what right. makes you unique and an individual. And I'm hoping that, I don't know. I mean, obviously we're in Southern California, which is sort of like the Kardashian empire and all that. But I... I really believe that the the way out of this is sort of, um, you know, individuating ourselves rather than homogenizing ourselves. Right. I agree. She, I think she can't watch uh, 1883, the new uh, Yellowstone spinoff. She can't watch it because everyone's teeth are white. <laughs> they're white and they're perfect. Who yeah. in 1883 had no. perfect white teeth? No. So she's like, Nobody. Nobody. It's, it's, uh, and it's, they're yeah. so perfect and white that they don't even look real like today. No. And so I was like, and now I can't believe any of this plot. Like, I can't believe any of the story. You've totally pulled me out of it. Yeah. And what actor and actress are you going to get that have 
screwed up teeth. Yep. It's really hard to Not find. in LA. Why, why wouldn't they scuff up their teeth a little bit? You can put like stuff on your teeth to make it look at least yellowed. I mean, I could buy the straight if they were at least, they are like neon white. Oh my God. They're like a reflector. And that, I'm like, I'm totally out. I'm totally out. But um, I, we got off track. We we're talking about eating disorders. <laughs> eating disorders. So I have a question yeah. for you. What, I, what was the hardest part about your, I don't even know. Do you want to call it recovery? Because I have, a, here's my thought. Yeah, okay. Tell me. I think different people have different processes with trauma mm -hmm. and with addiction. And I think even though I don't know anything about eating disorders, but to me, some of it is ritualistic like an addiction can mm -hmm. be right. So they have hints of the same. Obviously they're not the same. And I am under no illusion that I understand the differences in the same, mm -hmm. but for me, a layman looking at them, I go, oh, I see. They're both coping mechanisms for trauma. Absolutely. So for me, when, like I'd mentioned before Burke came, I coped with trauma with alcohol. Mm -hmm. I drank way too, I drank to the point where I lost my hair mm. and my liver had become enlarged. Wow. And I was that kind of drinker. Wow. I was drinking. Yeah. I quit drinking when I was 21 because I'd started That's drinking huge. at 14. Wow. So at 21, I was like, I don't think this is making me happy. Mm. So I'm just going to stop doing this because I think it's causing really destructive behavior. Yeah. So maybe I should just stop that. But I was still so tumultuous that I had to go to therapy to figure out what was causing the turmoil, right? Mm -hmm. And then unravel that. And then alcohol had completely different meaning in my life. Yep. I drink, how often do I drink? Maybe one glass of wine a week. And if we're at a party, I'll have a couple glasses of wine, but I could just as easily not have it. It, yeah. ha it means nothing to me now. Yeah. At the time, I wouldn't have told you I was uh, using alcohol to cope. I just was blitzed all the time. Yeah. But it's similar to what you said. You got into therapy to start unraveling this intergenerational body trauma. Body trauma. Yeah. And then that, did that shift how... You looked at food like it shift how I looked at alcohol? Definitely. I mean, so I'll go into sort of the the, the low point into getting help and then sort of I, the one thing that I keep thinking of is throwing up it, like in a toilet, whatever, is sort of the same. Your mouth goes into the same shape as screaming. And so I think for me, vomiting was a way to release anger and anxiety. Um, wow. Yeah. It was a silent scream. I may not be able to listen to this podcast. I might be opening my brain up to fucking because I'm the kind of guy that if you tell me about cutting, I'll try it. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't. This is by no means. Vomiting is uncomfortable, except if I you're, don't like I don't yeah, like uncomfortable. Vomiting. But the thing is, is when you're bulimic, it fires off um, dopamine. And so it actually it, it feels like a release mm. and and it feels like um like I had a, I have a friend from college and he was bulimic and he was, and he was like, I think what's so hard about being bulimic is that no one wants to talk about how good it feels. Mm. And it's not good. It's not like, you know, sunshine and rainbows. It's like the same feeling of, you know, like the, you know, first sip of alcohol for an alcoholic. It's like sort of that same Riding sort of Riding a roller like, coaster and you get a rush. Exactly. Like that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And Interesting. so. I did not know that. Yeah. I love that you had a friend that was a guy. We had a friend. I had a friend who's bulimic in college and probably still is. And I remember we all, we were watching football and we were eating pizza and he ate an entire pizza. And then he went in the backyard and threw it up and it's just in the backyard in front of us. And we're like, what the fuck are you doing? He goes, I eat too much pizza. Yeah. And we're like, that's bulimia. And he goes, no, only chicks get bulimia. I'm just, I don't want to gain no. weight. And we it's... were like, I remember I could tell you his name and you'd be like, you'd be like, what the fuck? Yeah. yeah. You can tell me later. <laughs> I'm not here. Uh, yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 more prevalent in men than I mean, even more so now with like obviously with social media like Facebook found that like one in three girls develop an eating disorder from using Instagram. Wow. And it's like, that how is, is that sad. national news? Yeah, like, how is, that, how is that something we're sweeping under the rug? Right. And yet we're still using it. I'm still using it. You know, mm -hmm. I have to. That's like how I work. Well, I only follow bulimics, but keep going. <laughs> <laughs> So what was your bottom? You were so what was my your... freshman year of college. 
Um, so it was the first year I lived in New York. Um, I wasn't ice skating anymore. I just joined the rugby team. I dyed my hair pink. I was, I was rebelling for the first time because in high school I was, you know, I was perfection per- per- personified, you know, mm-hmm. like so much so that people would be like, what do you eat? You look so good. And I would be like, oh, well, this is what I do. And it was like my thinness became my identity. Mm. And so when I got to college and I started gaining weight, I sort of kind of started losing control that I had had for all those years. And so, you know, I was like, you know, binging ice cream on a Saturday night and purging. And, you know, I was kind of like, oh, I'm not home and I have to like sneak around and do this. Wait, so this I, feels weird. Can I ask when was the first time you, you purged? I remember the first time I purged was in the seventh grade. I was in my mom's shower and I just remember just being like, I feel like I ate too much. And I sort of just like kind of burped out a little bit of steak. And I was like, like, this is something I can do. Like, and that's sort of the first memory of like, wow purposefully doing it and like i was talking to my brother about this um because he said he was we were going to school one day and i was i always am very slow and so he ran upstairs and he heard me vomiting Mm. and he was like what are you doing and i was like what do you mean i'm not doing anything like nothing's happening it's fine and 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 what's hard to sort of track is like how many times i threw up because it became so routine for me that i i I can say like, I don't think I was throwing up more than like once a month, but I don't know. Right. Um, And so sophomore or freshman year of college, I came home for spring break and uh, you know, it was kind of this weird push and pull because you know, my mom, like we would go out to dinner and I would eat how I wanted to. And then my mom would be like, are you sure you want to eat that? Mm. And it would just send me spinning. And that was sort of our routine, right? It was like she was used to policing what I ate. I was supposed to obey and listen. Um, And so that spring break trip, I purged, I think, eight times in one day. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And then I was like, this is not good. I was like, this is this is a mental disorder now. (laughs) Like, this isn't something I can ignore. And so I went to my college um, mental health services they gave me a list of referrals. The first name on the list I called and I was with her for like 10 years. Wow. So I was really lucky in that I found a therapist who, you know, used health at every size and feminism and intuitive eating rather than sort of recapitulating the eating disorder and being like, this is what you have to eat. Like what I had to eat was never part of the conversation. Wow. What's, what's interesting is that f- for for anyone that may perceive your your mom as policing your food is is as a negative with that negative comes the positive that your parents did raise raise a pretty fucking good kid to to recognize this is bad i need help right like every parent should be every parent should be lucky enough to say i raised a kid who recognized bad behavior like that's pretty fucking badass yeah i hope my girls have that like i need to go to therapy they do i I think they do yeah i don't i don't (laughs) <laughs> the, they they do i mean yeah. I they, do. they do they've already kind my, of shown me that yeah already um i think i have to go out and organize the man cave okay the, what you call it um i i'm fascinated to listen to the rest of this podcast and by the way i would just detract because all i think about are jokes so i just throw in jokes <laughs> and i think this is an important conversation and i wow. and i'm glad you're having it because I, i'm going through i don't know what i'm going through right now but i think you're going through a great deal of stress and yeah. that you're managing it by eating and you're feeling out of control in a lot of areas and and your eating is reflecting that you're just yeah. eating in a bit of an out of control manner so some i think you know sometimes babe you get very ungrounded and i think now may be a time when you may not be super grounded okay i think intuitive eating would be helpful for you cuz it's less about taking things away and more about like if you if you were like I want ice cream I'm sure like and you were practicing intuitive eating you may not even finish the ice cream because you're listening to your body and saying huh this doesn't feel good anymore right yeah. I wish I I wish my body had bells on it when it was like <laughs> ding, 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 ding. it Little starts to light. it really starts to yeah I I'm fucking it's a new skill you have it's to learn. A, oh listen. I, I came to this with like absolutely no idea of how to feed myself. Like I was telling Leanne, like I went through like a long period of time where I only ate spicy tofu pad thai every day. That sounds so good. It was so good. <laughs> and then it started to hurt. And then I was like, OK, well, I could have spicy tofu pad thai once or twice a week and that would be fine. You spicy know? food was my diet for a long time. Spicy food and coffee. Ooh, that's a shit. esophagitis nation. I have still have. I, I, I have way, esophagitis. What's, this, what is, what's that? It's um basically my my esophagus is inflamed. Oh, I just throw up in my mouth when I sleep. 
no matter what. Oh I my eat, gosh, no matter That's, what I eat, I've had that too. Oh my All right, gosh. I gotta go. For, I'm gonna. Uh, this is an important conversation. I shouldn't be a part of. Uh, well, I appreciate. Well, you should. You being I'm glad here. you stopped, Dan. No, I appreciate you. But you, I appreciate you coming on and having this. Po- She's wanted to do this podcast for a long time. I'm, I'm honored to be here. I have. And shout out to your parents. I will. Oh. All parents are well, not all parents, but your parents are good parents. They are good parents. They are very good parents. They, they just are. every parent is flawed, and every not me. <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> every, I'm flawed. I'm doing things that I'm sure ten years from now my daughter will be. You destroyed me here, yeah. and I will go. Oh my god, I did not mean to. I had no idea I was doing that. My intentions were good because we're human beings. You yeah. know, the, one of the hardest realizations I had as an adult was that my dad was human. Yeah. You know, I thought my dad was like a god. I mean, that's what happened to me this year. I'm like, sure. Big time. And then there's good and bad that come with that realization. There's some really real love and emotion and positivity. And then there's like this devastation and grief and loss that comes with the same realization that, hey, my dad is just a guy. Yeah. Just doing his best. Absolutely. And look at all these mistakes that caused me pain or trauma that he didn't mean to make. Yeah. But they happened. And what are you going to do? Stop loving him? No. You, it's just such a such a hard transition and shift that I think a lot of people don't talk about. And maybe some people don't go through it, but I definitely did with my dad. Oh, yeah. I mean, my dad getting canceled this year was like a really weird experience i can only imagine it was big time it was yeah. weird it was like I, I like i'm both like i don't know it showed me so much about how <laughs> how people view celebrity and what happens when people turn and like i'm just sort of of the belief that like if there's a possibility that they will turn they will always turn 100 like, percent, yeah and you know it was such a like people were coming for me <laughs> like this one person who is a substitute teacher in North Carolina. Uh, he started messaging me on Twitter being like, your father's a piece of shit. And if you believe anything he says, you're just as crazy as he is. And then the next message would be like, I'm so sorry, your father's a lunatic. And then the next one would be like, watch your inheritance disappear. And I was like, dude, what? I'm what? like, I believe COVID's coming. I have been locked in my apartment for two weeks. Like, right. come on, man. I'm a, I, come on. And so it's, it's, you just can't engage with people sometimes when when someone has that extreme a reaction to someone. Yeah. Someone especially that don't even know. Yeah. And there's no way that everybody has every fact of every word that anybody ever said or every action ever taken. And if someone ever makes a misstep these days, one small misstep yep. and you're dead forever. And it's unfair. Yeah. It's unfair because people who aren't celebrity don't do that. No. You know, if no. your neighbor made a misstep, you would not condemn them forever. Yeah. You would not do that. Well, so, yeah. These people, Drew is a person who has yeah. done so many good things for the world. Yeah. And I don't even know, I, I heard about the canceling, but I don't even really understand or know what it was for because it he didn't was make just sense wrong. to he me. He was wrong about COVID, you know, and he has been hanging out with a lot of Fox guys. And so he was getting kind of like preachy and people were reacting to it. Right, and it's right. like, okay, yeah, you can react to it, but like, don't bring me into it. That's no, not no. like, that's my, Absolutely. that's my dad, but I'm not responsible for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, it's like, if I could do something, I would totally, but I can't totally. Um, so let me ask you this. Yeah. I've had a couple of guests on this podcast who, who told me they had eating disorders. Uh, one was still kind of fresh. Mm-hmm. The other one, she's my age, and she had one when she was a teenager mm-hmm. and drew the line directly to trauma. And I asked them both to talk about it, and neither of them would talk about it. Why? Why do you think that is? I mean, the the disorder, eating disorders, are, you know, kept alive by keeping secrets, mm-hmm. right? And I, I think... I think it's still really taboo to be like, I used to throw up, you know, or I was anorexic because then you sort of one, you admit fault when this is like sort of a manifestation of perfectionism for the most part. Mm -hmm. And two, the secret's no longer a secret. Mm -hmm. And I think sort of what keeps eating disorders tantalizing is sort of the secretive nature of it, which is why I've been so open about it because like, for me, when I wrote that piece in the Columbia Spectator fall of 2013, um, 
it was really premature. Like I had only really been in recovery for like a year and a half for the most part, maybe two years. And it kind of was like this manifestation of like wanting to have a better relationship with my mother and wanting to put, you know, this sort of like quintessential intro essayist mode of like, I'm going to put a bow on the end and everything's fine, you know? Um, but I'm, you know, it, it kind of catapulted me to being public about it in a way that I had never anticipated. Like Mm -hmm. when the New York post picked it up, it was like, I was on the view and entertainment tonight and extra and CNN and HLN. And I was doing it all. And I was like, I'm going to be the change in the media that I want to see. Right. And of course, like everybody was like, your dad didn't know you had an eating disorder. What Uh. was that like? Or you say your mom is the reason you had your eating disorder. I'm like, no, I, no, did. no, I didn't no, say no, any no, of those right, things. Right, right, yeah. Um, That's really unfortunate. It was really, it, it taught me a lot about the media sphere. Sure. Um, And it's- That's really unfortunate because then they missed, they missed the point. They absolutely missed the they point. They went to the sensationalist, pip. that's really sad. I did a lot of um dodging, a lot mm-hmm. of like artful dodging mm-hmm. where I was just like, my mother and I have a complicated relationship, but we're working on it. And I'm right, like, right. my family is just a regular family like anybody else's. And it was like very like my hair was bleached and curled and I was wearing like a T length dress and I was like <laughs> playing the part. And I think that's part of why like this book stuff felt very nerve wracking to me because I had performed the perfect daughter in a, you know, kind of like a like let's save the brand kind of way. Mm -hmm. And so what's been so exciting about this, you know, the book and like being here is like, I'm able to talk about it in a way that is authentic. That is, you know, uh, true to what I actually feel rather than like presenting, you know, the seven minute clip, you know, it's like, they're just trying to get a soundbite out of you Mm -hmm. and there's no nuance in a soundbite. None whatsoever. And you know, the truth about, um, uh, health, I think is that, True health can't happen without complete honesty. Yeah. And and that being said, that means being honest about the shit, the shit. There's yeah. so much shit in life. Yeah. And I don't focus on that. I focus on all the daisies. Yeah. But shit makes daisies grow tall. So yes. you have to look at that too to be honest and to be fully healthy and balanced. Yeah. And I don't know why I wish it weren't so hard for some people, uh, because a lot of people like with canceling your dad, just the shit it overpowers everything else. Mm. And really, he's got to have some shit or he wouldn't be a human being. Yeah. There's nobody who, who Mother Teresa, maybe. Yeah. Maybe she Gandhi. doesn't have a lot. Yeah. yeah. But maybe she does. Yeah. Maybe she does. And we just never found She's it. She's got a mean streak we don't know about. Maybe. <laughs> a mean for good. Mean for good. Yeah. But <laughs> I think it's. I I wish if anybody got anything from listening to my podcast is that t- your secrets make you sick. Mm-hmm. You're and only as sick as your secrets. That is the truth. And even if the secrets are hard to carry, I guarantee you there's someone in your life who'll help you carry them. And I guarantee you there's someone in your life who will say, I have that same secret. Mm-hmm. And now it's lighter for both of you. Yes. That's the truth. I mean, I really think that they're, of course, it's vulnerable to share, right? It's vulnerable yeah, to admit. Totally. Flaw, fault, sickness, whatever it is. But it's only through exposing a wound to oxygen that it can heal, right? Absolutely. And so the more you sort of are honest with yourself and unearth the things that are making you feel powerless and also maybe potentially looking at the things that make you feel like you're in control, mm-hmm. right? Like what is giving you the illusion of control? Because the reality is no one has control. No. Tr- control doesn't exist. You could die at any second. That's right. Surrender is the only thing you can control. Absolutely. You can control whether or not you surrender and to, like we said in the beginning of this conversation, remain open Mm -hmm. and remain surrendered and say, let life take me, have a plan, have a goal. Totally do that. It's not just to say that you should wander aimlessly through your life. Yeah. Should have a goal and a purpose and a value system that pushes you forward. Yeah. But then after that, You have to remain open and surrender and say, I am ready to receive what it is I'm supposed to receive. And at that point, your life is full. Yeah. Even when it's hard. Yeah. Even when you have some some baggage. You know what? It's really interesting. I did a podcast about um, being in a sorority. Uh Uh-huh. I was in a sorority for a couple years. And during the time I was in the sorority, 
two really hard things happened. Mm. One is my dad and his wife divorced. Mm. They had been together for, I was seven when they got together and I was 19 when they divorced. Mm. So for a very long time, yeah. she was like my mom. Um, and my dad had a bit of a breakdown mm. and, and I was helping manage him. At the same time, I got date raped in college. So, and I was already drinking. I'd already been drinking from all this bullshit from my childhood, from yeah. my mom. Yeah. And I just kind of spiraled. Mm -hmm. And my sorority called me in. I just talked about this on another podcast um, and said to me, uh, but like the, I was called into, oh shit, I forgot the name of it now, Standards. And yeah. they said, we think you have a drinking problem. Wow. And we think you need to go to rehab and we're happy to help you find that out. And I wow. was like, big middle finger. <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. And I ended up leaving school. Wow. And I left school, went to another school, but I left my group of friends because the trauma was too hard to bear. Yeah. And, I, and since I did that episode, I've had so many of my sorority sisters message me and say, we had no idea this was going on. We wish we had known. Wow. We would have loved to have helped you. Yeah. We would have held you up. We would have held your hand. We would have done all these things. And I believe they would have. Yeah. But your secrets, they're so unhealthy. And of course, I didn't want anybody to know that had happened to me. And of course, I didn't yeah. want anybody to know I couldn't handle my dad. Yeah. I couldn't handle my dad. I was 19. Yeah. And he was How too, could you? It was an upheaval for him. Yeah. And on top of everything else, it was really nice to know, it was nice to hear from them that even today, they I, I, they care. And they cared then too. And yeah. I don't think people it, think about that. It's hard to recognize care when you're in your own illness. You are right. That's so beautifully said. Because... I mean, if someone had tapped me down and been like, you're bulimic, I would have been like, no, I'm not. What yeah. do you, I mean, my brother did. Mm. My brother found me vomiting and was like, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm not doing anything. Right. Nothing's happening. Right. And denial is such a palpable feeling. Mm -hmm. And he, the only person that can sort of refuse denial is yourself. Mm -hmm. Oh, almost choked on my spit. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> That must Holy. have meant something. <laughs> I felt that. I was like, oh, God. Uh, you're right. Denial is very powerful. I have to tell you something, though. If they had never called me in and they had never said, we think you have a problem, down the line, I'm not sure I would have said, huh, I think I have a problem. Mm. So it's, it planted the seed. I think it did. I think that was extremely important. And even though I couldn't bear it, yeah. I couldn't bear to stay in that group. Because I was ashamed. Yeah. I think I was ashamed of well, also, everything. There was no, I mean, I'm assuming no conversation about assault either. No. Oh, I buried like, it. I didn't even, yeah. I didn't even remember it yeah. for like seven years. And then it came back like, poof. I mean, it come, it's lives in your body. It does. It lived totally in my body. Yeah. And it came back when I had a baby. Really? Yes. And then I remember now why I brought this up. It came back today mm. when I got the messages from my friends. Wow. I sat in my closet and cried for about 20 minutes. Wow. And in the crying, I thought, this is about the trauma. This is not about today. This is super old. This was all very old shame. But you needed to feel it. You yeah. needed to express it. It you was all to... shame. All of it. All the tears were shame. And you think you're done. You yeah. Know? The, I was 19. 51. Yeah. You think you're done, but I... It's never done. Always try to stay open. Yeah. And so when those messages came in, in staying open, I had this emotion and I just surrendered to it. And when I'm going to go in the closet, just cry it out and let's feel all these nasty feelings yeah. and get them out so that I can... I don't want them in my body. Yeah. Um, But that open and surrender is just... It's the key to everything. It really is. I so in my early twenties, I started experiencing like debilitating migraines. You did? Oh, horrible! Like once had a week long migraine. <gasps> it was like week? after the solar flare, and I'm positive that the solar flare call it caused my. Oh migraine. my gosh! It was intense, but like so much so that like 
one time, like half my body went limp and I like felt marble going up my neck and then I had to be hospitalized. And I think, thank God my mom was in town. So she was able to like come to the hospital and like sort of like be like, hey, nurses, what are you doing? My daughter needs help, you know? And yeah. like, I was so glad that she was there to advocate for me. Um, but the one thing that really helped my migraines was um, cranial sacral therapy, mm. which is sort of, it's not Reiki, but it's sort of like, light touch slash energy healing mm -hmm. where essentially like I would lay on this woman's table and she would lightly like put her hands on the bottom of my heel and I would tense up thinking oh this is a ballet teacher who's going to pull my leg over my head right and it was like oh ice skating is trauma <laughs> like yeah I went through extreme training and pushing and all these things and that mm -hmm. still lives in my body and so over the course of like six months, I sort of learned how to rather than sort of letting emotions getting trapped in my body and then leading to, you know, anger in my head. And like, it's the same thing of like throwing up is the same thing as screaming. It's like, mm -hmm. what did I do? Look, I had no longer had that release. Mm -hmm. It was all pent up in my body. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, she would put her hand sort of at the base of my skull and I would like feel like sort of release and, you know, some like she would kind of have me talk. And I just remember this one session where it kind of all clicked to me where I felt the emotions sort of run their course through my body and allowing them to do that. And now I don't really have migraines. That's crazy, isn't it? I had migraines too. And Reiki took care of it. Really? I did Reiki. Yeah. For six months. Um, he was a guy who did massage and Reiki together. Wow. So he would get in a part of my body and yep. just work it with massage and then just start pulling stuff. Wow. Reiki's amazing. I mean, people think it's like voodoo or whatever, yeah. but I could feel energy being pulled out of my body. It's the most bizarre. I've never gone to see any other Reiki person because I'm afraid they won't be as good as he is. Yeah, well, once you find someone good, you can't, you can't mess up. But he's in up. Florida. <laughs> he's too far away. I can't go see no. him. But yeah, it changed my life. I went to him because I had headaches. Yeah. And I walked in the door and he went, ooh, you have really bad headaches. <gasps> never even talked to me. And a psychic sent me to him. How crazy is that? <laughs> I went into this, I went to this Halloween party and they had psychics there as yeah. like the favor party favor and i walked in her tent and she went you have really bad headaches and i went i do she, she could feel it she said you have a really bad relationship with your mother and i went i do and she said wrote this guy's name down and said i think this guy can help you wow she never even called him i called him walked in the door and he said you have really bad headaches and he looked at my body and he goes you have some serious issues with your mother and i went i do and he goes i think i can help you but if you start walking this path you can't go back. Wow. So you got to choose. Are you going to walk this path? May change everything. You may lose everybody in your life. Yeah. But it's the only path to health. Wow. So you got to make a choice. And I was like, I choose health. And it changed my life. Have you read The Dance of Anger? No. It's an amazing book. I, uh, the, the author is escaping me, but it's basically about like sort of um, feminine rage and the ways in which it's stored in the body because really? women aren't allowed to express it. Uh -huh. And so it's like kind of like, I, I read it years ago, but I highly recommend it. It's okay. a great book. Um, and it just headaches is one of those manifestations of anger living in the body. Did not know that. Yep. Okay. I have headaches once a month now. It's, what are you angry about? Girl, <laughs> where should we start? Where do we start? <laughs> I have a lot of anger from, I have a lot of old anger and I have some new anger. Yeah. But, um, you know, I grew up not in an articulate household. Mm. So no one hit me like I was no one was physical with me. I got spanked like everybody else that grew up in the 70s. Mm -hmm. But I was not abused physically ever. Yeah. But I also wasn't taught how to express myself with words. Mm. And I'm a very high energy person. So once I got into college, I started fist fighting. Really? That's how I got my anger out because wow. I did not even know I needed a word. Maybe even started in high school. So if I got angry, I hit people. And then they hit me back. Sometimes boys never really hit me back. Yeah, but I would hit boys, and I got to be at a certain at a certain age. And in therapy, I realized I had so much anger I could not contain it. Yeah, and I was not taught to express it verbally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I had to learn as an adult. Yep, because my dad would get angry and he'd just break shit. Yeah, he would never touch me. He'd go in the yard away from me. Yeah, and break shit. And wow. I go, well, that's what you do. Yeah, you just break shit. My mom would destroy the room. 
Wow. No, so you were doing what you were taught. I was doing totally what was modeled. And, but that's so unhealthy. Yeah. And then you have nowhere it. So my point is my instinctive way of expressing anger is physical. Mm. And I can't do that. If I'm in an argument with Bert, I can't beat him up. Yeah. Yeah. But that's what my instinct wants to just start swinging. Yeah. Well, I have to start swinging with my words. And sometimes even just the delay of coming up with the word makes me more angry. It's an interesting process. Anger and I have had a a dance dance. of anger is I'm literally I'm going to send y'all a bunch of books, please. Yeah, I'm intuitive eating body respect held at every size and dance of anger. Dance of anger. Sounds good. So how are you feeling with it seems like you're feeling great with your eating with everything's good. You know, it's I wouldn't say that like. I don't equivocate over what I'm eating anymore really like I don't know I mean I went to the doctor and usually I tell them so this is something I like to say is like when you go to the doctor you can ask them to have you on the scale backwards and not tell you your weight yep um but this time I was just curious about how much I weigh and I like looked at the scale and I was like okay and it was like the first time that I like heard my weight that didn't like spiral me and like you know, make me feel like, you know, I was a bad person or whatever. And I'm quite easily the heaviest I've ever been. Mm. And so that was sort of like an exciting moment for me where it was just like, oh, I really do believe that I uh, like I can have health at every size, you know, like I work out with a trainer. I like I try to eat fruits and vegetables and sort of um, a framework that one of my writing students actually introduced to me was sort of um, and I'm going to sort of butcher it, but it's sort of thinking about the frequency of food. And so there's mm. sort of four tiers of food. So it's like on the first tier, it's like obviously like fruits and vegetables, like certain nuts and oils or whatever. And then on the second tier, like wine is on that and mm. like, uh, you know, lean protein or whatever it is. And then the fourth tier is like liquor, you know, like and and it's Oreos, Oreos, like exactly. Yeah. Like high processed foods. Yeah. And. I like the idea of thinking of the frequency of food because it is an energy that you're bringing into your body that is going to be integrated into your body. Mm -hmm. And I just like as a sort of intellectual exercise, like thinking of it that way because it's less prescriptive and it's more like what energy do you want to bring into your body? Mm -hmm. Right. And that has been helpful framework for me, though, like, you know, it's been the holidays. I've been doing whatever, you know, but as we all have, as we all have. And, and, you know, it's been really beautiful is like there's been no sort of like shame or morality or whatever. It's like I got twisted on Thanksgiving and it was great. (laughs) You know, that's awesome. It was good. Um, And so. I, you know, I go through periods of time, like during the pandemic, I was like spontaneously vomiting because it was like anxiety provoking. And Mm. I was like, oh, this mechanism still lives in my body. Mm. Um, But for the most part, I feel pretty much at peace with myself. And I feel like I feel so excited by the potential of what is coming. And I feel less focused on like how I look and what I weigh and all those things, because I feel like it's just minutia to make you feel like one, you're in control and two, that like you have worth when we all have worth and we're all worthy That's no matter our right. size. That is right. Yep. I heard this person talking about diets and I'm going to totally butcher this, but yeah. I liked what they were saying. What they were saying was if you eat like a regular person, not going and getting eight cheeseburgers and yeah. eating them in a phone booth, yeah. that may not be what a regular person does. Yeah. But if you eat like a regular human being, mm-hmm. you know, you are the size you're supposed to be. Yes. Set weight. Set That's point. what you're supposed to be. Mm-hmm. And so if you just be that and be happy there, everything works itself out. Your health, your your mental health. And I thought, what a great way. It's like some people are meant to be 100 pounds and six feet tall. Mm-hmm. Some people are meant to be 100 pounds and five feet tall. Yep. And some people are meant to be 130 pounds and five feet tall. Yeah. And that's just how your body is. Yeah. It's your genetics. It's your background. It's your, um, yeah, it's just who you're supposed to be. Yeah. So I thought, what a healthy way. Why are we even worried about it past that? Well, so part of the sort of health at every size um, sort of education is about like, so you have your set point, like that's your weight. And every time you diet, 
you can lose weight, but your set weight gets higher, Ooh. right? And so every time you do restrictive dieting, you may lose the weight, but you're going to gain it and then maybe and more then so. some. Yeah, yeah. And so the more you mess with your metabolism, mess with your eating, start restricting, the more damage that you're doing mm. to your body's set weight. You mm. are inherently raising your set weight. And wow. so for me, with someone who has like a lot of diet trauma, like it makes sense that my body's heavy. It's right, so like right. my body went through you know, nine years of starvation, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, of course, it's going to hold on to everything and mm -hmm. say, like, this is for the next winter, you know? Yes. And so I I really I think, you know, I think morality and shame should be taken out of food. Totally. I think, you know, the more that we shame people for being fat, the more they're going to feel shame for themselves and feel worse about themselves and then continue, you know, using food to sort of aid their feelings mm -hmm. and feeling control and things like that. Um, and so like as a fat person, like it's interesting because when I started talking about this, I was like, you know, a, a straight size fat? person. But are you fat? I mean, look at you and go, she's fat. I don't think that. I yeah. think you look like you. I mean, that's the thing is like, I, I, I am fat and I think that's a cool thing. Like, I'm like, okay, okay. like I'm, I'm fat. And that's part of sort of the ethos that I had been diving into for, you know, when I started you know, intuitive eating at 19, where it was mm -hmm. just like, well, I don't care if I become a size 16. And now mm -hmm. I'm a size 16. And I'm like, I don't I care. Kick ass clothes. Yeah, like, you do. You I, do. You I totally love do. my wardrobe. <laughs> right. You know, like, is it hard to find cute clothes at a size 16? Sometimes. Yeah. But when I do find it, that's amazing. I mean, totally cute. Game over. Totally. <laughs> yes. And you're at a pen and, and it's my, just my done. top ramen girl. It's just done. Um, <laughs> One more quick question, yes. and this may not be quick, but what? so I know that your therapy was non-conventional, would you say? In terms of like eating disorder treatment, yeah. So conventional therapy, they just get you to, I don't understand why that would be acceptable to just get you to your... I mean, when it comes to like anorexic people, mm -hmm. like truly anorexic people, like their low body weight is going to lead to death for the yeah, most yeah. part. And so I understand sort of like taking them out of the risk zone. Mm -hmm. What I don't understand is sort of like um, I've like had friends who were like, oh, I only have, you know, two weeks here and then I have to be out. And it's like you can't you can't fix that in two weeks. No. And so it's kind of like, you know, insurance companies and the way those structures work and, you know, eating disorder treatment if you're really ill is very expensive. Right. Um. But I really believe that, like, there is such a focus on sort of uh, weight that there shouldn't be. Right. Like, yes, anorexics need to be pushed up in weight. But also it's like, let's talk about your home life. What mm -hmm. trauma did you experience? Like, what is this sort of a symptom of? It's a mental health. So it's the same problem we're having everywhere. Yeah. With homeless, mm -hmm. with addiction, with eating disorder. It's all Bandit. at the bottom is mental health. Oh, absolutely. It's trauma, mental health. Yeah. Absolutely. Totally. And it's, you know, I think what I love about you saying, like, you know, it's sort of, um, it's the same hurt. It's a different manifestation. So for me, it was vomiting. For you, it was booze, you right, know? Right. And it's like, it's the same sort of impulse to mm -hmm. either release anxiety, pain, fear, anger, mm -hmm. or to feel a sense of control. Mm -hmm. And as I said before, there's just no one has control. <laughs> no one has control. No one. No. Jesus, no. take the wheel. Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> Jesus got the wheel anyway. Yeah. So whoever your Jesus is. Elvis. Whoever. That's right. Yep. As Elvis. Yep. Yes. Elvis, take the wheel. Elvis, take the wheel. Well, anything else you want to say on this subject or um, any subject at all? Because I could talk to you all day I know. Long. This has been so wonderful. Yes. I love talking to you. I agree. I it's love talking to you too. so wonderful. And as soon as you leave, I'm texting your parents. <laughs> Like last time I was like, she is the most amazing young lady. I just love her so much. She's amazing. Aww. I will be doing that again well, because you are. so highly of you. They well, really do. That's very sweet. I think very highly of both of your parents. Yeah. They're both I, good people. They are. And yeah. I feel like I know them individually. Yeah. Like I don't, I know them more individually than as a couple. Yeah. Um, and they're both really great people. They and are. And really giving and very, they're just wonderful people. But yeah. um. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess my final comment would be, you know, if you are struggling, if you're in the midst, you are in the grip of anorexia, bulimia, binge eating, PICA, rumination, you know, eating disorder, non-specified, um, get help. Tell someone, right? Whether that's 
your mom or your dog or your best friend. Like just practice saying it out loud um, because the more you hold it in, the more you're hurting yourself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's you don't have to live this way. You Mm -hmm. don't. And if the worst thing you fear is gaining weight, then you got to wake up because there's a hell lot more to fear. (laughs) Because let's look at the world. It's burning. That and whatever's at the bottom. Yeah. Is is never as scary as you think it's going to mm-hmm. be. I think that's one thing people don't understand who have had scary things happen yeah. to them or have done scary things they're ashamed of. Yeah. It is never as scary as you think. The anticipation of the therapy or the healing is far worse than the actual therapy or healing. Definitely. So if you can just believe that, believe that diving in and digging that crap out, Mm -hmm. it's really not going to be as bad as you think. And Mm -hmm. even if you have to go in your closet and cry for 20 minutes, that's not even as bad as you think. No. It's really not. I think it's important to think of sort of your chest, your solar plexus, your being as a garden and you're tending to it, right? And the more you pull out the weeds, the more space you have for flowers and vegetables and fruits and all these things that you want the the diverse ecosystem of your soul to to uh, inhabit and you know if you as you were saying like daisies grow tall out of shit you know it's like well you got to plant those daisies you do and you got to pull the weeds before you have space for those daisies absolutely they don't so, grow from nothing they don't nope well thank you so much will you come back again and talk about oh, something else absolutely tell me what else you want to talk about uh, literally anytime oh okay okay well you have to come back again thank yes. you so thank much you. it's so nice to see you likewise you look lovely thank you you look happy you know no i love complaints. your plan for life <laughs> i love you i love you too i think you're amazing thank you and i'm going to call your parents and tell you tell them all about oh you. where yes. people can find me oh yes where can they find you thank so, you so i am M I Z Piggy one 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 on Instagram and Twitter, and I have a website. It's paulinapinski.com. Uh, I do writing coaching, so whether you need a college application essay or a personal essay you're working on, or a memoir or a poem, I can help you facilitate all of that. Um, and then in January, I'm going to be leading a group of people through the Artist Way for twelve weeks. Amazing! Yeah, so that's you. Anyone is welcome to sign up for that on my website. Okay, so tell me before you leave then. I didn't know you were doing that. Yeah. Tell us about The Artist Way because yeah. I know what it is, but yeah. I don't think people listening know what it is. So it's a 12-week spiritual workbook um, meant to sort of unlock your creativity. Um, it was written by Julia Cameron in the 1970s. And it's it's honestly one of the more transformational tools that I've ever had access mm-hmm. to. Um, this will be my fourth time doing it. Wow. Um, I led a group of people through it June 2020 which was a tumultuous period of time and a weird time to be like let's focus on ourselves right but it actually ended up facilitating sort of deep transformation and really interesting conversations amidst sort of the chaos of the world Mm -hmm. Um, and so the 12 weeks is sort of focused on unblocking your creativity and so there's like a chapter a week and at the end of the chapter there's like tasks you have to do and the task will be like if you have a pot that needs to be repotted repot it or like you have clothes that need mending, mend it. And then it'll also be like, you know, who told you you weren't creative as a child? You know, like sort of the 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 sort of range of tasks are like menial, sort of you have to do them and then like deep exploration. Mm-hmm. Um, and then amidst all that, you have to do three pages of morning pages, stream of consciousness every morning. And then you take yourself out on an artist date once a week. Mm. So that'll be you know, going to the movies or literally stepping into the cathedral or going on a long walk. Um, Ultimately, I really recommend this for people who are creative but don't know how to express their creativity or how to integrate that into their lives. Mm -hmm. And also, if you just want to meet other artists and it's going to be a really great group of people and um, we're going to be meeting weekly and moving through it together. It'll be sort of self-paced with sort of support along the way. Um, And then I also have an option that if if you want weekly meetings with me, that's an option too. Um, And so I'm really excited for it. And I'm mostly doing it because I need the structure to like start writing again (laughs) because I've just been so in the like promoting, promoting, promoting mode. And so I'm I'm personally excited to to get down and start working and doing the work. So are you going to do the artist way with them? Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Okay, I've never done the artist way. You want to do it? I don't know. I don't know. Listen, I'm scared. I'll, if you wanted to get a group together, 
of people. Mm-hmm. I could lead it for you at any time during the week. Basically. Okay. Like you could have your own group of artist white people. Well, thank you. I've yeah. heard so many people say it's life changing. It is. It's absolutely life changing. It's um so maybe I will. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll sponsor a scholarship for your group. Okay. Would that be okay? Yeah. Okay. So wife of the party will have one scholarship for your group. And then you can determine who gets that scholarship. Okay. I don't know how you'll determine that, but I'll take um, applications. Yeah, take applications. And where would they send those applications? What um, do you think? Send it through my website. Okay. Just say that you're applying for the Wife of the Party scholarship, and I will um, come up with a little pool and I'll pick somebody. Awesome. And then I'll maybe I'll just maybe I'll join the pool yeah. too. We'll see. We'll see. I'll go on your website and check it out. Sounds good. I'm so glad. That's really awesome. That'll be really great. I'm Such excited. a transformative program. And you're a great person, I bet, to run it. You know, I, I try. Bet. You know. <laughs> well, thank you, Paulina, so much for coming back on. Thank you so me. much for having me. Thank you for talking about this subject, too. Seriously, I yeah. tried to get two other people to talk about it. So I'm really, really glad that you did. Thank you very I'm, much. It, again, it's an honor and a privilege. Well, thank you. <laughs> 